All right, on to our series, and I've really enjoyed this series, uh, which is talking about the keys of the kingdom, not just because I haven't preached any of it for the last two weeks, but it was great to have Sandy and Liam really come in, and I, I really wanted them to bring a strong theological pathway for us to talk about the authority that we have um, as believers, as you place our faith in Christ, because we're not just passengers on a journey if you've ever been overseas, you, you may have noticed um, sometimes uh, you're there just to have a holiday. You want to embed yourself into the whole scene. My dream, Trish and I are dreaming about this right now, trip next uh, is business class for anyone who wants to do, do sponsor that. But we want to, we want to head over to uh, just pray. Um, <laughs> uh, we, our dream is to head in the middle of Italy and not do the touristy thing other than Pompeii. We do want to see Pompeii. But we want to go into the middle there and let Trish do a, a one or two week not, Nana's cooking school to learn how to make the stuff and, and me and whatever friend I can find, we're going we're gonna to hire a convertible Ferrari or an Alfa Romeo and we're going to go up the Alps while she does that. But um, we don't want to be isolated, you know, and sometimes you go on holidays and you see these buses full of tourists who just sort of parachute in, they stay in their bus, they pop out and take some photos and then they're in the bus again and they're out of the country. It's like they've been somehow, they've been there but they're not there. They're just passing through and they're insulated from it. And that's not us. That's not our story. As you, as you know, you're toughing it out day in, day out with family, with careers, with the world, with inflation, and with all the mess that's our life. And yet somehow we're not, we're not called to be isolated and insulated from that. We're embedded in that. And we have a role to play in that. And that role is incredibly spiritual. And in the West, we downplay this understanding of spirituality and we confine our faith to uh, good, good example, faithfulness, um, and, and as if somehow that can replace fruitfulness that can only come from the Holy Spirit. And so this series really is about laying, because I know in the West, uh, if you can convince the soul, the Spirit's more likely to come along. So we've given you a bit of a pathway. But today I want to talk about the, the raw spirituality of uh, the keys of the kingdom. And so we're bouncing off Matthew 16, 19, where Jesus says, and in this verse, he's particularly talking to uh, Simon Peter. He goes on later and says the same terminology to all the disciples. He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And somehow they knew what he was talking about, hopefully. Uh, we find it a little bit harder. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Some translations uh, give a better rendition of the tensing there, and they say, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound, uh, sorry, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound on in heaven. So you're really, you're doing here what's already happened and given permission to happen up there. And so our role as kingdom priests, as we've seen, is to make heaven, uh, make earth look more like heaven, to connect the two. We're a priest with a hand in both places. But he says it, and there's different phraseology, and sometimes we get caught up in a, in a phrase because it's the only phrase we have. And we forget that the phrases that we read in Scripture are sometimes articulating a concept, a principle, and if you can read the other phrases into it, it gives it a bit more perspective, the other facets to the diamond. In Luke 9.1, uh, it, it said Jesus called to the 12 together, and just as he did with the 72 later, and he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. So one moment they didn't have power, they didn't have authority, and the difference between power and authority is a bit like a policeman. Uh, the power is the gun, the authority is the badge that authorises him to use that. Lots of people have power, some of it's legitimate, some's illegitimate, some's used wisely, some's not. But, but if you go through the process to qualify, you get the badge. And so he's saying, I'm giving you the badge and the gun. Go on out and do my work for me. And so in this series so far, uh, Sandy's message was one we'd been storing up for a while. He'd preached it at night and it was a burden on his soul, but I love the way he, he really finished it up and summed it up to say that God continues to reveal his word and it's expressed through the church. This is key because the word of God is the expression of God. God is spirit. What happens when God, who is spirit, expresses himself? He expresses himself in words that are created. He expresses himself in the begotten son, Jesus, who was a perfect expression. He was the Logos, is the Logos of God, the, the word of God, the expression of this God who was spirit. And so we see this expression of God come into the world. And now he has said, I'm sending you one just like me, one of a like kind, 
the Holy Spirit to be in you. So now that word of God that created all that is, that was then manifest in the begotten son Jesus, that came through the Holy Spirit, now continues on that line through you and I, in all our imperfection, this perfect spirit is wanting out to express the will and word of God in our life and in our planet. And so what this all boils down to is that we're authorised, we've been given power, we're stewards of his presence, we are priests of God, priests with one hand in heaven, one hand on earth, with his authority to express in and usher the purposes of God on this planet. That's a big deal. I don't know whether you've noticed that. Uh, you, you are not ordinary people. We're not weirdos either. We're not supposed to be weirdos. It's not a license to be strange. But, but Paul says we are peculiar in that we are unique. We're normal people with a, with a super normal God dwelling inside of us. And it literally does and should be changing pretty much everything about our life. Pretty much everything. And so we're not just passengers in a bus travelling through and taking a selfie hoping we get to heaven unscathed one day. We're here authorised to make a difference. And every situation and every moment we find ourselves in, permission's been granted, the gun's in your holster, the badge's on your shoulder, you are authorised to change the world completely. If we live from that space, that changes everything. And so we, in some ways, our role is dual. And, it's, and, and the best allegory I could find for this was that because we're still a commonwealth of sorts, if you understand the king, we have a king now. Um, but we also, in Australia, we still have, until we take a vote on this, we have a governor general. And the governor general represents the king. So the governor general has been given authority. So as we've seen in this country, some of the, um, the expats from other countries won't know our history too well, but in 1975, the governor general sacked our, our prime minister and the administration. That wielded a lot of power and it went down really badly, right? Because it's an imperfect kingdom in that sense. But he exercised authority to do that. And there was nothing Australians could do about it. So we're like the Governor General, but in a much more positive sense. We're Governors General. Male and female representatives placed on this planet to steward this planet well, to not only tend it, but to make it look more down here like it is up there. And we're representing the king and his agenda. And we've been given the power to do that. But beyond that, it's almost like we would be like if William and Kate, Prince William and Kate, they're awesome, aren't they? It's almost like we're them. We're not, not only the governor's general, we are also the son and daughter of the king. It's, so it's even upgraded even more. Talk about friends in high places, hey? We're, our, our dad is the king. We are the governor's general, the, 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 the offer a, a service of regency as regents to this planet. It's incredibly powerful. It's almost like, how dare us see ourselves as poor little Christians who've got to hunker down? You know, yeah, that's, nothing could be further from the truth. But the devil has one agenda or two agendas. One is to separate you from God. The other one is to show you that, that you are weak and powerless on this planet. And so there's two-way traffic in this co-governor um, general sort of function that we have. Because when, the, when we're governors general, it's when the king wants to come to town... They don't just come unannounced. They work through the local representation. Indeed, the local representation officially, if you know the protocol, invites them down. So our role in that sense is to invite, Father, come, let it be as it is in heaven, let it be on earth. That's our role is to literally, that's what prayer is. Lord, bring it down. And so we have this two-way street going on where the prayers go up, and the blessings come down, and in many ways, we're the conduit that God could bypass you, and he does now and again. But if we're doing our role properly, and as Wesley said, nothing happens but by prayer. If we're doing our role properly, the prayers are going up, and the blessings are coming down. Some of us think our role is just to pray. But if you're introverted, and you're not really good with humans and people and conversation generally, you're, you're emailing bullet points, Prayer doesn't come so naturally, but you may well find blessing does. Because if you're not people-oriented, you're probably task-oriented. And there's a lot of tasks to do. So you don't need to feel, you know, manage your guilt about your prayer life. But if, you're, if you struggle to communicate to this God that you can't see, well, you know that's a, that could be a challenge at times. There's a good chance if you're a task-oriented Christian, and there's probably a, a bunch of them in this room, 
you may well have a natural tendency to call down the blessings of God in a proactive, intentional, aggressive, and militant way, and you haven't had a chance to take it up yet because you just didn't know. Well, now you do. Now you can, get, you can get hostile, agile, and mobile out there in the world and start to get it done. So this blessing flows up from us and down from God through the world. And you can see some examples of this, and I'm going to bombard you a little bit with text and scriptures today just to prove the point, but then roll this out in a pathway that you can see. In 1 Peter 3, 9, Apostle Peter says, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, so we come with a different spirit to this world. On the contrary to that, because that's the way the world fights, tit for tat, fight, fight. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because... This is what I love. To this you were called. Hang on. This isn't just a commandment. This is a calling. So you're not not supposed to do life like the world does. You're not supposed to argue and come in the same spirit. You were called to something completely higher. You You were called to repay evil that comes at you with this thing called blessing. To this you were called so that you may inherit the blessing. And he starts to usher in this language. That's the language we were talking about just a few weeks ago. And if you weren't here for that series, we did a series called Bless, How to Bless Your Neighbor. He uses this language called blessing. And again, here is this word that I want to really drill down on today is what is blessing? Because we've, we've, we've been given our spiritual practices of how we can be a blessing to our neighbors. But the first one is be praying. And, and this is what I really want to activate today. How do we pray this blessing over people this week and next? So in Genesis 2, 2 to 3, we can, we can reflect back on this blessing because the Apostle Paul, uh, through Romans and his writings, he, he echoes back to this again. And he says this blessing, he even terms it a gospel in some limited sense. But it was the promise that God gave to Abram as the first person to live by faith from whom a nation of faith people would come. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. Might have been a brand new word for him back then, this idea of blessing. I'll make your name great and you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So what is this thing called blessing? What does it mean to bless or be blessed? Well, it's a multifaceted principle. You can't just tie it down with with one word. Um, But in the scriptures, particularly in the New Testament, there are two main facets two main words that wrap around this idea of blessing. One is to be blessed. So we can can be a person who is blessed. And that's an adjective. It's a a descriptor. The word is makarios. And I'll probably savage the Greek there, but makarios. And it literally means to be fortunate, to to be prosperous, to be in a a position that others may even envy. It's It's not justifying envy. It's just saying people will see you as one who seems to have a whole bunch going good for them. And this blessing, to be blessed, is a state that we're in. So Ephesians 1.3, Paul talks about our state of blessing. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, so we already have it, in the heavenly realms, with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So what's he talking about there? Well, Ephesians 1, it goes on to list a lot of these blessings out. We are redeemed uh, by Jesus Christ. His blood paid the price for us. We are chosen. Somehow before the world was, was formed, we were already chosen. Can't get my head around that one because I seem to make all these decisions and yet he, it's like he knew them in advance. So we've been chosen. We have knowledge of his will. Do you know what God's will is? Ever pray for that? Apparently you already have it. We have favour. We have grace. We have gifts. We have identity. We have eternal life. We have fellowship with his spirit. What more could we want? We can't lose for winning. We already have every spiritual blessing. So we are blessed people. So that's the adjective. That's what it means to be blessed. It's like you've got this warehouse of stuff that other people will look at and go, I wish I was you. But then there's another word which means to bless. So it's not that I'm blessed, it's I'm blessing others. And so the Abrahamic promise there was you'll be blessed to bless others. So there's this whole idea of to bless, which is the Greek word eulogia, which I've definitely ruined the Greek there. Eulogia, which means to pour out benefit or to pour out bounty to prosper someone else. So from this warehouse, you're now giving it away. You're a river and not a lake. So it comes and as it comes, it goes. So the more you give away, the more channel you open up for it to come. And this is just a principle of scripture. So you're giving from the abundance that you have. Paul talks about it, 2 Corinthians 9, 8. He uses this word. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you abound in every good work. In other words, 
to bless others. You're blessed in and abound so that you can give it all away. Fantastic. So let's tie these three messages together because I just want to, I want to get to the point. And if you haven't heard the last uh, couple of messages from the other boys, uh, please listen to them online because there's a connection between blessing, our role as priests, a kingdom of priests, and this whole idea of the word of God that lives in us through the spirit. Because blessings are in actuation in, and in activation are, are spoken over people. There's a, there's a spoken element over blessing. So we're imparting something. It's not like we're giving them a $10 note and going, bless you. There's a, there's a spoken element to it, just in the same way that God blesses through what he says. So the word of God becomes incredibly important. There is something about the word. There's something about what is spoken. So blessings are spoken, and as kingdom priests, we've been given authority. We can choose not to walk in it, but you have it as a legitimate ordained role by God. And our words of blessings convey God's words and his expression of what God, who is spirit, is bringing forth and promising. As we said, God continues to reveal his word through the church. It's fascinating. So we're not here to just waste oxygen and just get through to the end. There are blessings to be given, to be received and given, that God has given us. And somehow I think the more we give blessing away, the more these blessings will come through because the channel's open. It just opens up so many possibilities. But the implication is that the words that you speak are incredibly important. The words you speak over yourself, over others, over who God is, and over the situations in the world. Incredibly important. And this has been a bit mind-blowing for me because I've never really um, had to dig into this to the depth that I have this week. It's just, been, it's just been a mindset that I've always assumed. But once you get into the theology and you realise there is no escape from this principle, this means that what comes out of here has the power to change the world as long as it's under the unction of God. I'm not just talking about sounding spiritual. Sometimes we, we say things that, that sound so silly that they're just coming from us. But, but if we're learning to listen, if we're, if we're following Jesus' model, I only do what he's doing, I say what he's saying, the power and the potential from that is incredible. Proverbs 18.21 says, the, power of, the tongue has the power of life and death to those who love it will eat its fruit. Sorry, I got the wrong context. And those who love it will eat its fruit. What fruit? Life and death. Now, you could think, well, he's just using hyperbole here. This guy's waxing lyrical, but he's not. He's, he's actually not. In the tongue is the power of life and death. Look at what James says in the, in the New Testament, our black and white James, you know. No man can tame the tongue. It's, a, it's an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless, there's that word, our God and Father, and with it we curse men. And have been made, who have been made in the likeness of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and curse. Isn't it true? I don't, want to, I don't want this to be true, but this isn't that true. Out of that same mouth I proclaim blessing and cursing. And so we see these two powerful sets of words, blessing and cursing. Blessings are what we're ordained for. It's, what we're, it's in our DNA. It's what we're called to. We've inherited that, Peter says. And that blessing is to speak life over people, whereas cursing, <laughs> cursing is speaking death. It's speaking judgment. It's stealing destiny instead of speaking destiny out. John 10.10, 10, the, the evil one has come only to steal, to kill and destroy. That's, that's what cursing is. We sometimes think it's a realm purely of witchcraft. But the scriptures have just told us it's actually incredibly easy for us to do the same thing to speak death, to speak limitation, to, to take away people's destiny, the God-given calling upon their life that they're still yet to live into, to take that away and instead rob it with criticism and judgment and over-defining people and all the stuff that we do because that's Australian culture, which is a spirit of stupid in my books <laughs> because it just seems to go against everything that we're seeing here. The power of life and death is in this tongue and the way I use it. And there's something about it. It's not just because we get to speak, because everyone out there gets to speak, but you get to speak as a kingdom priest. 
as God's ordained and authorized gun in the holster, badge on the shoulder person. You're not just normal. It's a bit like, anyone remember Anthony Albanese before he was prime minister? No one listened to that guy. Everyone was sort of surprised when he became head of the party, let alone win an election. Bless his heart now, Lord. Bless our, our, govern, our government. They need it. But suddenly, when he gets on the news, I'm listening. Because what he says matters. If he says this or he says that, economies change and markets change and people gain or lose their jobs, there's a, a contract with the states or there's this or there's that. What he says now really matters. Now Albo's got my attention. Now he's got power and authority. That's like you. You may not notice it, you may not feel like it, but when you go into your workplace, you go there with power and authority. You go into your school, you have power and authority. It's your role to change the atmosphere and let the kingdom come as it is in heaven. Wow. What you say really matters. Let's dig a little bit deeper into that. Because in the kingdom, blessing and words are like hand and glove. Blessing and what we say. It's like words are the interface. As we've seen, the word of God, kingdom priests, blessing. The words are the interface, the word of God, his intent spoken through his people. Now, if I was speaking to you in French, as a, this little fun fact, the word blessing is, oh, Tanya, did you know this? You know every other word in other languages. I've got you. The word in French, anyone know the word in French for blessing? Benediction which is just a French way of saying benediction. Benediction. And that means good speaking. Blessing, benediction, means to be speaking well, whereas cursing is malediction, which means bad speaking, speaking badly of someone. This isn't witchcraft now. This is just human beings speaking well of someone or speaking bad of someone. Benediction, malediction. But this, this word... Um, Benediction comes from, is, is rooted from the original word, you, <laughs> I'm messing the Greek, eulogia. And our word eulogy comes from eulogia. So eulogy is speaking well of someone when they're dead. It's a benediction. In the Old Testament, it becomes even, even clearer. In the Old Testament, the word is barak. It's much easier to say, and I just can't get it wrong. So I love that word even more. So to be blessed is, is barak. And it has many meanings, many nuances about it. So you can, it can mean that I'm kneeling. It can mean that I'm praising. It can mean a, a term of salute. Uh, it can be a term of thankfulness. So that's why they say in the Psalms, bless the Lord, O my soul. It's a thankfulness. Lord, I thank you. O my soul, I thank you for all that you've done. Another, word, another facet of it is to speak excellently about someone. So it's, it's the same as eulogy in that sense, speaking excellently. But there's another primary meaning that was one of the first uses of the word, and that literally means to speak the intention of God over something. To bless something is to speak the potential and calling of God over a situation. I bless that. And you know what, I'm, that instinctively you'll know what I'm meaning, I'm, I'm blessing that. Yes, let that, let that come to pass. It's to, to, to declare God's will and his intention. So in Genesis 49, we see that where, where Jacob blesses his sons and he prophesies over them what will be coming of their life. Because as he was un under the unction of the Holy Spirit, he blessed them and called forth who they would have become. So it's speaking destiny and intent. And this is incredible. This is the authority that you have to speak this intent. So a couple of scriptures to back that up. Genesis 1, the first chapter. God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing. God blessed them and said. So he blessed them and said, he spoke over them their intent, be fruitful, increase in number, and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase. So there's the intent, there's the blessing. It, he was drawing out that potential. He was saying, this is the gold I've woven into your DNA. I'm calling that out. So I speak that blessing over you. And there's a, there's a role that we play that becomes very parallel to that. Uh, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 27 in Genesis. So God created mankind in his own image. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, and on it goes. So in the blessing, the blessing comes with the word and the word speaks out God's intent and promise over their life. How powerful is that? You get to do that. Anyone, Christian or not, you can do this because God's woven destiny into all of them. Everyone we meet, we can begin to bless them. 
And it might be as simple as encouragement where you've seen something about their life that you see potential or they're good, uh, where they're excellent at something. You can, you can call that out in their life. And, say, and, and that's, you don't even have to use the word bless. You just do the blessing. Encouragement gives people courage like that. But you can see why then listening and following to what the Spirit is saying is so important. It's not just going willy-nilly and saying whatever I say will be. That's, that's taking it too far. It's saying, no, I'm listening to what God is saying. As a priest, I've got, I'm tuned in to what the Lord is doing and saying, and I'm following what he's doing. Jesus gave us the model. So 1 Corinthians 1.20, Paul says, what is our peace in this? Now, it's almost like he, he's spoken this, but it, it's, it's a full stop on the end of our theory here. He says, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ, and so through him the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. You ever wonder what that means? It means we see the promise, we see the potential, and our role as kingdom priests is to say, yes, it's to bless it. Yes, amen, so be it. It's just another way of saying that thing that God's doing, that thing that he's done in you, I'm calling it out, let it be, yes and amen to that. It all sounds very Pentecostal, but now you know it's not just Pentecostal, it's Christian. It's legit. It's a mandate. You've inherited that. It's a way, it's the mode in which we work. We work. And uh, you've, I've, I've spoken it many times, so I won't give the detail, but my clearest example of this, obviously, was a young child that I prayed for who was only days old, who had a, a death sentence and weeks to live, and literally didn't know what I was doing, but just prayed God's destiny. That was the prayer, Lord, let your destiny be over this child. Called out the destiny, not knowing there was a death sentence on the child. But something broke in the atmosphere, and that child not only lived, it prospered in two sets of medical results. Cancer, one day. Two days later, no cancer. Now, that, that child has grown, ducks of the school, got their own children and living a fantastic life. See, God has destiny over people, and there are people even here today, you may be suffering under sickness, you're under, under just consistent problems. It's like, what is life conspired against me all my life? Is this my story? No. Sometimes we need to get the God's people around us and go, I'm breaking that. I'm binding that stupidity because that doesn't belong to you and I'm calling down the blessing upon your life. And that's our job. We're going to do it here in a minute. Break this junk off our life. We're not here to be victims of the world. We're not here to be constrained. It's our playground. It's the sandpit that God's given us. Amen to that. It's good news. And we're supposed to be good news and bring that good news. And so we can be specific. We don't just say, I bless you. We draw out the specific intention that we see God has put in their life. We're, we're gold prospectors who mine for gold in people's life. And we bless what God is blessing. There's a lot more fun to be had than what we've been having as Christians, eh? And so we come in this opposite spirit to the world. It's like we're just, we're just different. You expect, they expect us to say something negative, but we just overflow with this good stuff. 2 Corinthians 10.4, Paul says, The weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So you're not, you're not imagining it. If you're sick, if you've been sick for a long time and it's like your whole life has been battling sickness, you're not dreaming that up. That's horrible. That's terrible. It's debilitating. If you've been rejected in your life time after time after time, there may well be a stronghold in effect that we, we can't see. And it feels like shadow boxing sometimes. To be honest, we don't understand too much about the spiritual realm because the scriptures don't talk in a lot of detail about it. And so sometimes from success and from some anecdotal stories, we build a theology. But to be honest, we're not, there's not a lot of good, strong theological constructs we can make around this. So we've got to stick with scripture. And a stronghold, from what I can gather, and over the years I have done a fair bit of research on this, a stronghold is a partnership between the way we think and the things that we speak over ourselves and demonic influence that would agree with that. Would say, yeah, I'll come into line with that. I agree with that. And so we form this partnership and it becomes a stronghold that's very hard to break because I'm in agreement with it in my head. I'm in agreement that I'm, that I'm useless or I'm in agreement that my life will never be anything or, or I'll always be sick or whatever it is. And I come into agreement. I'll always be disappointed. I'll always be disinherited. I'll always have disease and all these disword comes up and we partner with this thing. And it becomes a stronghold because we need repentance to break its power. Because the spiritual realm is like we build a landing strip or it's like a, a rubbish dump where we wonder why the rats are there when there's so much rubbish around. And we've got to clean that rubbish out of our mind so the rats have got nothing left to feed on. And so blessing 
is much more powerful than cursing. And God's destiny is no contest compared to Satan's. There is no argument about who's in charge. There's no even battle between good and evil. God is so much beyond and so much ahead and so much infinite, whereas the devil and all his minions, they're they're created beings. They're finite. They're not living in his glory like you are. You can tap into God's glory all day, every single day. He can't do that. He can't read your mind. He can't do that. Don't think he can. He's a finite being. He has no power over you that you haven't given him. And so we have authority. There is no contest, but we've still got to play our part in this whole thing. So 1 Peter 3, 9. Peter talks about it. It says, don't repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay, repay evil with blessing to this you are called. And what is that blessing? At its very least, our weapon of war is kingdom peace. It's where there is chaos, where there is trouble and where there is turmoil and every disword you can, you can think. The shalom and the peace of God, we're authorised people to come and bring that into any situation. Some examples. Luke 6, 28, Jesus says, Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. It's funny, I, I, read, I read that and I'm, I'm, I'm starting to become the eternal optimist with Scripture. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Sometimes I think the person that mistreats me might start doing really well. And they'd be going, I'm doing great. You think, you're doing great because I'm praying for you, Buster. <laughs> Romans 12, 8. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. This is, a, this is something, this is, this is us now resisting culture. Resisting our culture. Bless and do not curse. And I've defined cursing as tearing down destiny, speaking badly of people speaking badly of, of, of situations. Because you're, you're saying something that's the antithesis of the kingdom where all things are possible. Bless, do not curse. Because blessing is always more powerful than cursing. Is there been someone that I've been cursing in that sense? We don't need to get uber spiro about it. It's not about witchcraft. It's like, but have I been speaking against someone? Because I'm robbing them instead of building them up. And I'm doing the devil's work for him, to be honest. So why don't, we, why don't we activate this in our own life? Maybe as, I, as I've been speaking, you've realised I've been cursing someone and I think it's a challenge that we all face. We face difficulty and we just want to talk about it and, and, re, and reject and so on. But at Mark 1.15 when Jesus says, you know, look, the kingdom is near. There's a moment in time here. There's a window of opportunity. The kingdom is right at hand. You need to re- repent of that and believe. So the repentance side of that equation is I need to turn away from that way of thinking. So Father... I want to confess to you, and confession is just agreement. It's agreeing with God about what's true. Like it's true, I've been doing this, and I'm going to stop it right now. Show me, show me who I need to forgive. Lord, show me what I've been saying that's, that's wrong and needs to stop. And Lord, give me something else in its place. Give me a blessing to give away in its place. So maybe that's what we need to do. So why don't we, um, before we do anything else, just do that. Let's just clear the spiritual air over each other, over those people in your life that have been hard to handle. Let's just close our eyes and just pray into this now. Holy Spirit, I pray your kingdom would come. Lord, that you would be with us right here. Father, I lift the burden of guilt off each of us because, Lord, in reality, all of us too often lean this way. We say what shouldn't be said. Father, I confess the things that come out of my mouth sometimes should not be said. Lord, we pray your forgiveness. We thank you for your forgiveness. And Lord, I thank you that heaven, it's almost like heaven just waits for the chance for us to do these prayers and and has a party, a repentance party. Because Jesus has already paid the price for that. And so we don't need to feel bad. We just need to repent and turn around and do something different. So Lord, will you just highlight now in our mind if if there's someone that we've been cursing, someone that we've been pulling down. Father, forgive us. And Lord, it's more than likely, and you understand that our complaint is probably valid. That's why we're so cranky. But Lord, as you say, judgment is yours. 
not ours. We're not built to handle that judgment. So, Father, we give that right back to you. We clear the scales that we feel compelled to balance up with our own judgments. Lord, we clear the scales and we pray instead that you would bless them. Father, that you would help them to become all that you've called them to be. That they wouldn't be constrained by our criticism. Will you bless them? And will, will you lift off our shoulders the responsibility of having to fix and equalise what's been so wrong that's been done to us? Will you bless them instead? And so the Lord's called all of us to be a blessing. So Lord, will you show us right now as we, we've all had a, a card given to us again in the bulletin today about who do you want us to bless? Father, who do you want us to be a blessing to today? Father, give us a face, give us a name. And Lord, we just pray that before the day is done, because this is the spiritual practice, that we follow on and we bless that person today. It might be a conversation, phone call, text, email, thread, Twitter, all of those things. Make contact, human to human. Bless them. And so, Father, I pray for our Mondays. I pray that each one here would have a revelation of their identity in Christ to be a blessing to this world. That no day is wasted, no hour is wasted, no engagement, no conversation, nothing is without purpose. And we can choose to be a kingdom priest releasing blessing in that moment. Give us the faith and give us the words to do that in Jesus' name. Amen.